Good morning. Welcome to Sunday worship at St. David's on this beautiful day. Um, just a few announcements, most of which are printed in the bulletin, which you can read at your leisure. But just a couple of reminders. Well, first of all, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Brent Ellis, who is our guest preacher today, and he will introduce himself properly when he comes in. Uh, of course, we extend our uh, sympathy to the families of Kay Scott and also to the Ellis family. And a reminder that John Ellis' funeral will take place here tomorrow at 2 p.m. with a reception to follow in the church hall. AMS are reminded of their meeting following worship today. And uh, for those who are curious about our rummage sale yesterday, uh, proceeds were $469.25. Thank everybody who helped with that. And a reminder of the prayer shawl ministry on Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the armor room. Thank you. Well, good morning. A pleasure to be here with you. It's, I, my name is Brent Ellis, and I'm an elder and clerk of session at Chalmers Presbyterian Church in Hamilton, Ontario, and I'm a past moderator. That's my true claim to fame, past moderator of the Presbytery of Hamilton. So it's always nice to, uh, because I've been on Assembly Council, to uh, meet people from across Canada, Presbyterians across Canada, and I think that's my connection through Kathy uh, at, and this congregation. So it's a nice opportunity for me to be here. And I also bring greetings from uh, John Duff, and he was a minister here, I think, at one time, and he has fond memories of his time here at St. David's. And it's interesting because John and I have, our paths have crossed at various times over the years. We were tent mates at camp when we were young lads and then uh, we were at McMaster University at the same time and then at um, we were back at um, uh, at Knox College now uh, John was uh, a, a student there and I was just doing some postgraduate work and so was a resident there and so there's a, a slight difference in that uh, John is divine whereas I am merely theological. Uh, this is not a halo, you see, it's just reflected glare. <laughs> so there, there's a bit of a difference. The um, call to worship is uh, responsive. You who live in the shelter of the Most High will say, My God in whom I trust. God will deliver those who love the Lord and call on God's name. Come, let us worship God together. Let us sing to God's praise, number 324, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
let us attend to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this new day, at the start of a new month. You show us your mercy. Christ teaches us justice. We live by your Spirit, who enlightens our way. Blessed Trinity, you do not forsake us. We can walk with integrity because of your steadfast love. Hear our glad praises as we gather and worship here in this place this morning. Forgiving God, we too often push you to life's periphery. We serve you only when it seems convenient. We follow Christ when it is to our benefit. We call on the Spirit when our own efforts fail. Forgive us that we may be faithful servants at your table. We make us in your image of righteousness that we may be true disciples of the faith. We pray this in the name of Christ who has taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
sign and the choir. That was that was lovely. And now we all get a chance to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 746. 746. They come up to the front and I go down. Oh, the bird. 
Again, let us attend to God in prayer. Holy God, we wait in hope for you to speak. Come to us in scripture, read and proclaimed. Let those who hear guard the good treasure entrusted to them with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us all. Amen. And the first reading is from Lamentations, verse 1, 1 to 6. And if you're following along, it's in 1226 in your pew Bibles. So Lamentations, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. How lonely sits a city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn and no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young girls grieve and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. And then instead of a psalm, we're picking up again in Lamentations, chapter uh, 3, verses 19 to 26, and I'd like to read this responsively. This is on page 1231 in your pew Bibles. And here we get a glimmer of hope after that depressing first reading. So chapter 3, verses 19 
to 26, and we'll read it responsibly. The thought of my afflictions and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. The New Testament lesson is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, which you'll find on page 1772 in the Pew Bible. 2 Timothy 1, and there at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. If I thank, I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and, I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gives us, gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and com am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the gospel is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. You'll find that on page 1560. Luke chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. He replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I always...
always find it interesting when I come into a new church uh, to, just to look it over and see how it reflects our Reformed faith. And this church is, does reflect that Reformed faith because, of course, a church in the Reformed tradition is always very plain. And this is a very lovely church, but its beauty is in its structure and not in its ornamentation. And, of course, at one time, there would never have been stained glass windows. That would have been considered a distraction. Now, of course, we do have stained glass windows because they tell a story, and it's also something for the uh, congregation to focus on if the sermon gets dull. My own uh, church in Hamilton does not have stained glass windows, so we like to think that we're purer. If truth be told, we would love to have stained glass windows, but we could never afford them. However, another thing that a a church would not have had would have been organ or piano music. Uh, Again, that was considered ungodly at one time, but we've got used to that because, of course, there's this wonderful worship in music and in musical instrumentation. And I can remember, well, probably over 50 years ago now, worshiping in small churches in the highlands of Scotland where there was a presenter and a tuning fork or sometimes a pitch pipe and then they would, people would sort of drone on with the hymns. So it's much more pleasant to, to sing with, uh, with an organ or with a piano or even, even other instruments. But it's interesting, too, when we look at the symbols of our faith, and of course you have them all here. And the most important one, perhaps, is the cross. And you think, well, why do we have a cross and not a crucifix? We don't have the corpus, the body of Christ, on the cross, because this is a resurrection cross. The crucifix represents God's suffering and God's death, whereas this is a cross that God has has left, Christ has left, Christ is alive, he's among us and within us, transcendent and imminent. It's a different approach to faith with the resurrection cross. And of course, we don't have an altar, we have a table. And an altar is a place of sacrifice, whereas a table is a place of of sustenance and new life. A table is a place where we gather around in communion and as a community of faith to be fed with the, with the, the body of Christ, with the bread of life. And so there's a different approach to faith with that. And of course, also, the most important piece of furniture in the, in the uh, church is the pulpit. And the pulpit is always higher than or in front of the table. And originally, the pulpit would have been in the center of the church, but of late, the pulpits have been moved to the side. And of late, I'm talking the last hundred years, we move slowly in the Presbyterian church, but it's moved over to the side and then the lectern on the other side. And it's because... This is, this is where the, the word is, is preached. And this is the most important aspect of Reformed worship, is the preaching of the word. We're not a Eucharistic church, We're not, whereas the most important aspect of worship in the Eucharistic churches, of course, is, is communion. But here, it's the preaching of the word, and we go from there. And of course, another aspect is that our uh, ministers are expected to be highly educated. And you'll see pictures, I don't think they wear them much anymore, of ministers with the two tabs. And they represent faith and knowledge. And I think lawyers wear those as well, and judges. But I have neighbors and friends who are lawyers and judges, and I've asked them, what do the two tabs mean? And they don't know. And I'm thinking, maybe at, all, maybe at one time they were all Presbyterians, and they don't want to admit it. But it's certainly a minister, it's faith and knowledge. And if any of you have ever been to Toronto and to see Knox College, Knox College, when you look from King's College Circle at the college, the library and the chapel are identical on either side of the central rotunda because faith and knowledge as represented by those two parts of the building are of equal importance and weight. Faith without knowledge, knowledge without faith are baseless according to our Reformed tradition. So we have that, and it's important that we recognize those things because they they give us a certain strength when we come into a place of worship to see these and to be reminded of them. In my family, uh, there are a lot of November birthdays, 
And I attribute that to an over-enthusiastic response on the part of family members to the message of St. Valentine's Day. But three of my four grandchildren, my four granddaughters, have November birthdays. So a couple of years ago, it was decided that we would celebrate at Grandpa's house. So I said, well, okay, this is a Sunday. We'd have Sunday afternoon and evening. Now, I was preaching that morning, but I thought, well, I can get a dinner together. And it wasn't a huge group, because with larger groups, of course, we, we eat buffet style, and people eat with plates balanced on their knees, which is always fun. A little tricky, mopping up the food off the carpet later, but by then they've all gone. But this time I thought, well, we can there are only eight of us, eight adults, and the three little girls ate at their own table, that I could set a proper table. And we could pull out, pull out the, you know, the silver and the china and the crystal and, and do it upright. Now, I know the family tends to be a little intimidated by formal dining, but that's good. I like to keep the family intimidated. It lets them know the old boy's still in charge. But then at one point, I looked up, and there was my son eating his fruit salad with a fork Where did we go wrong in raising that boy? But then later, after dinner, we went into the living room to open the gifts, and the youngest one, who was then four, was a little out of sorts, because it wasn't her birthday, and it wasn't all about her. So she was flinging her toys about, and her mother said, Now, dear, time to put the toys back in the box so we can open the gifts. Well, she wasn't listening to that at all, fling, fling. So I thought enough of this so I got down at her eye level and said now look in grandpa's house you do what you're told so pick up those toys and put them back in the box right now well she was a little shaken but she did now of course I know she's been traumatized for life she'll need years of therapy and psychiatric help to get over this but that's her problem my problem was solved but you know I think that when we, when we do this, we, we're kind of reflecting as, as parents or whoever's in charge of the, the household, much like Christ does for us, that we prepare a table, we provide food, and we give guidance to the young. This is what we do. And it makes us feel secure. And it, it, it brings the family unit closer together, just like the communion, when we celebrate Holy Communion here, brings the congregation together. And the family whether they know the, the right uh, the cutlery to use or not, know that there's always a place at the table for them. No matter where they've strayed, where they've gone, what they've done, the family unit is intact and that there's a place at the table for them as there is within our congregations, our families of faith here in our congregations, and that's important. This, this chapter in Lamentations was, was a lament of anguish and grief. And it's a case of What happens if those symbols aren't there? What happens if this church were destroyed? What happens if our houses are destroyed? What happens if everything is gone? And this is what the the, the poet, although theologians feel it was probably Jeremiah speaking, was lamenting here. This is a time of the, the Babylonian invasion and in Israel, and terrible things had happened. Everything was gone. And We've all felt that at one time or another, perhaps. But it's a terrible time in the history of the the Hebrew people. And all the symbols of their faith were gone. Jerusalem, the holy city, was laid waste. The promised land was devastated. The temple where God was said to reside was destroyed. The Davidic monarchy was in exile and was gone. Where was God? And this is what the, the... what he was saying. Where was God? Does a loving and forgiving God punish us for our sins? Well, when you read this, the the poet of Jeremiah is claiming that, yeah, that was the case. But how can a loving, forgiving God be that destructive, like put that destruction on us? And there are many theories about this, and all sorts of different theories with different names, but this isn't an academic lecture on theological theory. It's a sermon where we draw meaning from the ancient text. And how can something that happened so long ago be relevant to us today? Now, this happened 500 years before the birth of Christ. It's ancient history, and yet we still read about it and get a message about it. 
What was going on was here was though Jeremiah was still in conversation with God. And I think we can relate to that. If we were living in Aleppo in Syria today, I think we could understand that reading because of all the destruction that is going on. But sometimes in our own lives, terrible things happen, even though everything is still intact physically. If the bottom drops out of our lives with different things happening in our lives, and we think, how can we face another day? You know, how can I get up this next morning and face a day and gone when there's all the things that were meaningful in our lives or in one of our lives has disappeared and has gone. What can we count on? And this here that that because Jeremiah was still in conversation with God and he will not be silenced, there's a theology of protest here in progress. And this very act of protest there awaits an end to the anguish. Things are as bad as they're going to get So now you start and you look for a new beginning, a nascent hope that pervades the darkness of life at that time. God and God's people are in an ongoing relationship. God has not been driven away. In their pain, the people know that God has not forgotten them. God is beyond their understanding, but stands with us. The lady that swallowed the fly forgot that. She went on and on and just got deeper and deeper into problems because she forgot where her help was. And she then ended up dying, swallowing the moose. Now, of course, that's not a true story, but nonetheless, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's telling. And then we move on in Lamentations, where we read the, uh, the, the, the verses in chapter 3, and you read the words, Therefore I have hope. Great is your faithfulness. You know, this hope in God, the steadfast love of the Lord, never ceases. And the person, Jeremiah, who was lamenting the destruction, still had this hope. He still knew what was going on. In the end, God is all there is. When nothing else is there in our lives, God or our faith is what carries us through. And there's where we put our hope. God is faithful in the toughest of times. And what force can possibly rescue hope from unyielding lament? And the answer sometimes is memory. The people of Israel lived between memory and hope. They were always remembering that God had led them out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the promised land. They constantly referred back to that. This is, their, this is where, they, where, they, where they were and where they had come from. And God, looking back and seeing where God had helped in the past, it gave them hope for the future. And God had done it in the past, and they do it again. Do it again. In the Christian tradition, we remember at the table, do this in remembrance of me, we hear, at the, at, when we're taking Holy Communion. So God, who has been faithful, will be faithful. And we praise God, not from a position of strength, but often from the broken edges of our lives. We wait and hope. And in verse 25, we read that the Lord is good to those who wait for him. It's not going to be easy, but it's an expression of our faith, and the assurance of, and faith is, the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen, as we read in Hebrews, or can read in Hebrews. The assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. And Paul reminds Timothy, who is wavering in his faith, that remember the faith that he learned from his mother and grandmother. Now, they would have been of the Jewish faith, but they were faithful to the Jewish faith. Now he's a Christian, pick up on that faith that they had. Because Timothy is wavering, and Paul needs Timothy to be strong, to keep the faith going in that just beginning, that start of a Christian community at that time. And faith will return to us the center of our beings. Paul needs Timothy to carry on the faith for him. And we often need a reminder of the importance of faith to be able to face the setbacks that come into our journey of life. The apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith. And Jesus said, or says to them, look, I can't just give you more faith. Faith is something you gain for yourself. You have some faith. Work with that. Even faith as small as a mustard seed lets you do wonderful things. So use that faith. And use your faith 
to serve, to serve God and to serve others, to serve your fellows. This faith isn't all about you. It's not for getting things that you want or that you think that you need or you think you deserve. Faith is you reaching out towards other people. He tells them that they have already have this faith and to fulfill their purpose to do justice and not to expect special privileges. I drive a perfectly decent 10-year-old gray car. Nothing wrong with it. Works beautifully. Doesn't give me any trouble. It speaks Swedish. I speak English. But we get along very, very well. And it's gray. Gray inside. Gray outside. All gray. Kind of matches my personality. So we're well suited. But then one day I had it up at the dealers getting serviced. And in the showroom was this gorgeous, new, sleek, black model with tan leather upholstery. And it was love at first sight. And I thought, this is it. We were fated to be together. And I could hear that car calling out to me, Brent, you're not a gray kind of person. You're a tan leather upholstery kind of guy. I'm yours. Take me home. And I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, this was, we were fated. I mean, it was just meant to be. And I could see us traveling down life's highways together as I softly caressed her tan leather upholstery. But then I checked the price tag, and it was $44,000. And I said, oh, baby, you are out of my league. But then I read about a TV evangelist who was talking about the pro- power of prayer. And he was saying how his mother had been praying for a swimming pool and how just praying every night for a swimming pool and sure enough one Sunday in church a man came up to her and said you know I think you should have a swimming pool and I'm going to pay to have a swimming pool installed in your property now I simply mention that should any of you be so inclined (laughs) but of course we don't pray for things like cars and swimming pools we pray for the strengths to see ourselves through the difficulties of life. We pray for what we can do for our faith. And it's, it's, I think we often get that mixed up, and especially with TV evangelists and a, pros- you know, a, a religion of, of prosperity. We don't pray to become rich. We pray to get through and to be helpful to our fellow people. Christian faith is hopeful and trusting and strong even in weaknesses. It's surprising and active. And it works for us as a community in mutual forbearance, that we work together through faith to get through our difficult times. And it's not wrong to ask questions and express doubts, but when all is said and done, faith can't be measured, only enacted, and this is the beauty of hope. When all might seem to be lost, God is there, and this is the source of our hope. So we come to church and we look at the symbols of our faith. And you may have been looking at the stained glass windows today. I hope not completely, but they're there for you. But still we have the resurrection cross, that Christ is alive and among us and within us. We have the table which, which sustains us, and we have the pulpit where the, the word is preached and spoken and gives us guidance. Not unlike when we provide a dinner for our families, when we provide a, a, prepare a table, provide food, and give guidance. And we think of this, I think, as we go through life, and it's these, these things that we remember that keep our faith alive. Amen. And to God be all praise and all glory. And now we sing uh, to God's uh, praise number 677. My faith looks up to thee. 677.
church. Our offering will now be received. Again, we attend to God in prayer. Almighty God, God of grace, mercy, and peace, you give us hope when all seems lost and we are in the depths of despair. Our faith is your gift to us just as our lives are your gift to us. We thank you for the spirit who nurtures us toward our first steps in faith, the spirit that keeps us from falling and plants our feet on a firm foundation. By the Spirit, we can see beyond today and catch a glimpse of a new creation of hope. With your Spirit to guide and guide and Christ to intercede for us, we can venture forth with confidence on our journey. We pray for all those in need of your loving care this day, for the victims of war and violence, for the refugees fleeing death and destruction, looking for shelter. We pray for those who are ill, for their caregivers and for those burdened with care, and especially for those dear to us who we name now in our hearts. Be present to them that they might feel your love for them. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 690, Fight the Good Fight, 690.
Go now in peace. And may God restore the road before you that leads to grace, mercy, and peace. May Christ fill you with the treasure of faith and love. And may the Holy Spirit help you to live in hope now and forever. Thank you.